Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. But today, I know you'll enjoy it. Because my colleague in the Christian Ed Department, but also my friend and my classmate from 1965 through 1969 is here to share with you. He gave me two lines to introduce him with that I am not going to use. (laughs) Although he's worked here since 1969, Don Regeer has had a distinguished career in visual media. It began in one of the classes here at Dallas Seminary where he and I made an eight millimeter movie that remains hidden forever. It will never be discovered. It's cost me a lot of money to keep that from coming to light. I am not in favor of public disclosure, but it launched him on a wonderful career. He has taken many awards for that. When he faced, he and his sweet wife Jan faced uh, the empty nest uh, period of life, they decided we don't like empty nests. So they went out and adopted two lovely Chinese orphans, brought them into their home or raising them in a truly Christian home. I am so proud of him. I'm proud to have my name associated with him in any way. And I know that you're going to appreciate what you hear from him today. My friend, my colleague, and my classmate, Don Regeer. I still have that movie. (laughs) You never throw away old pictures. Hebrews 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Every one of us wants a faith like that, don't we? We want to be confident in our trust and our belief. We want to be commended for our dependence on God. We want a mature faith. And God knows exactly what each one of us needs to arrive at maturity. Garrison Keillor's imaginary poet laureate of Lake Wobegon writes about one man's faith. Our people aimed for Oregon when they left Newburyport. Great Grandma Ruth, her husband John, but they pulled up in Wobegon 2,000 miles short. It wasn't always the dangers ahead that stopped the pioneer. My great-grandmother simply said, it's, it's been three weeks without a bed. I'm tired. Let's stop here. They stayed a week to rest the team, were welcomed and befriended. The land was good. The grass was green. And slowly, he gave up his dream. And there the journey ended. He built a house before the fall and lived there 40 years and all. And and right up to his dying day when he was laid to rest, no one knew. He did not say. His dream had never gone away. He still looked to the West. She found it in his cabinet drawer, a box of pictures, every one of mountains by the ocean shore the mountains he had headed for in the land of Oregon. There beside them lay his will. I love you, Ruth, the will began, and count myself a well-loved man. But dear wife, when I die, bury me on a far-off hill in Oregon and leave me there to lie beneath the mountain sky, off in that green and lovely land we dreamed of, you and I. At last she saw her husband clear, who stayed and labored all those years, his mountains all uncrossed, of dreams postponed and 
finally lost, which one of us can count the cost and not be filled with tears? And yet how bright those visions are, the mountains that we sense afar, the land we never see, the golden west, the golden gate, are visions that illuminate and give wings to the human heart wherever we may be. That old man by dreams possessed, by Oregon was truly blessed who saw it through the eye of faith, the land of his sweet destiny. In his eye, more than a state and something like a star. Old John, bless his heart, never made it to Oregon. <laughs> I did. My roots go down deep in Oregon's fertile Willamette Valley. My grandmother Clara lived there in a log cabin until they built the new house. My mother Ruth grew up in Pratham, a little village on the edge of the valley. There she attended the Emmanuel Mennonite Church. I was born in Los Angeles. <laughs> but I, uh, I moved to Oregon almost as soon as I could walk. Well, I was two and a half. That's when Dad became pastor of the Emmanuel Mennonite Church, my mom's home church there in Pratham, Oregon. My grandfather left his fingerprints all over that church building. By the time we arrived, he had added a crusader fortress to the front of the old building. <laughs> Strange for a peace-loving, non-resistant Mennonite church. <laughs> but then we even sang Onward Christian Soldiers and V is for Victory. The church bell was up there on top of those towers. I loved it when the teenage boys would pull too hard on that bell rope and they would pull the rope off of the wheel on top. Then Dad would let me hike with him through the attic, across the rafters, straight up the ladder through the trap door so he could put the rope back on the wheel. Then I was a warrior up there on top of my crusader fortress, raining arrows down on the enemies of the Mennonites. <laughs> From the pinnacle of that temple to its basement, it marked my life. It was in that basement when I was about six years old that I saw the slideshow that sparked my vision for a career in audiovisual media. The missionary Don Scheidler told a wonderful story with black and white lantern slides. Boy, I wanted to do that. And then there were the his and hers outhouses out behind the church. That's where mom learned to parallel park the 35 Chevy, but between the two outhouses. <laughs> and dad sat in the front seat next to her, sweating and yelling, cut it, cut it, cut it. Okay, she's all yours, take her away. Oh, he was nervous. I was a, I was a country boy. I thrived in that rich Willamette Valley. My brother and I pedaled our bikes to the two-room country schoolhouse in Pratham. Next door to the, to the Pratham co-op, the steam locomotive came rumbling by every day. At school, our only fights were about cars. Ronald and Gerald's fathers owned Fords. The Hofstetter boy's dad had a Plymouth, but our dad, the pastor, drove a Chevy. It was just an early form of Mac versus PC. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Don't want to offend anybody. I got my first taste of the world there in that country school. When television first came to our area, they brought a TV set to the Pratham Community Club, which met in the schoolhouse. My, isn't that violent, commented my dad after we saw our first shoot 'em up cowboy movie. And that's where I saw the hokey pokey for the first time. They stuck their backsides out and shook them all about. And I can't remember what dad said about that. But the centerpiece of my happy little life was the new house that they built just for us. 
It was more than a parsonage. It was home. They constructed it under the five Douglas fir trees that D.J. Steiner had planted back in 1911. And we moved into our new home on Christmas Eve, carried our decorated Christmas tree across the churchyard from the church basement where we had been living temporarily. On rainy Oregon days, and there were plenty of those, I played in the attic of our new house. One day I climbed through an opening and discovered my own secret hiding place. It was a boy's paradise. When the pastor's family was invited to a parishioner's home for Sunday dinner, they usually served us chicken. Now when Dad, the minister, ate chicken, he called it putting a rooster into the ministry. And then we had to suffer through his corny joke about why they put roosters into the ministry. Uh, you don't really want to know, but they put roosters into the ministry because they don't make good laymen. <laughs> and I, t I told you it was corny. We were surrounded by wonderful friends, by family, rambunct rambunctious cousins, grandparents, favorite uncles and aunts, Uncle Homer. Uncle Homer was my model of creativity, a builder, an artist, a musician, and a tinkerer. He was always redesigning the guitar, or the mandolin, or the harp. I think in this picture he may have been redesigning the kitchen sink, too. His, his oft-repeated phrase was, I wonder what would happen if. I love that guy. When I think of Oregon, I think of those mountains by the sea that old John dreamed of but never reached. I taste again the salt of the ocean spray. I dream of the Douglas fir forests where we ran free. Once again, I see snow-capped mountain peaks. I feel the ice-cold waters of splashing mountain rivers and streams. I hear the, the roar of waterfalls and the jangle of horseshoes at a Sunday school picnic. I remember a peaceful farming community, loving farm folks, family, and dear friends. Oregon was a young boy's paradise, but I lost paradise. It was the end of a lifestyle, the end of a dream. It was the end of childhood. I lost paradise, and I've, I've carried a yearning, a longing in my heart into adulthood. When I was 11 years old, we traded Pratham, Oregon, population 50 for a a large Midwestern city, population 350,000. We arrived on a summer day when the temperature and the humidity were running neck and neck. We exchanged Mount Hood for Mosquito Hill, the country for the city, the sparkling Pudding River for the Muddy Mo. We swapped a moderate climate for the sweltering heat and bitter cold of a large city. We traded our lovely little Swiss-German Mennonite communi community for an Italian Catholic neighborhood with its own image of Santa Lucia on parade right past our house. Pratham School for city schools where we had to look over our shoulders. Hopefully we could get to school without some bully stepping out from behind a bush. Hey, you! You Protestant or Catholic? I think there were some of Bob Garippa's cousins. <laughs> Finally, the only way to get friends was to become a hood, like everybody else. Now, I know, I'm, I'm sure there are people here from the Midwest who cannot wait to leave this frozen wasteland and get back there to the Middle West. It's your Oregon, and that's fine. Uh, that's your story. This is my story, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Our family just never adjusted to life in the city. Eventually, I attended Central High School, a very fine high school, one of the top ten high schools in the nation. We called it Hebrew Hill. Central produced people like philosopher Saul Kripke, actor Henry Fonda, football great Gail Sayers, and on and on. But I wasn't interested in school. I was a car freak. 
I was cool, you know, from the, from the West Coast. I dreamed of leaving in my 51 Chevy and <laughs> going back home. Finally, when I was still a teenager, I dug my Chevy out of the snow, finished rebuilding it, and pointed it west. Spent the whole summer back home in Oregon. It was wonderful. I can hear it now. No, that wasn't audio trouble. That was my 51 Chevy. <laughs> I, I wanted to attend Bible college in Oregon, but finally it was just easier to enroll in the Bible Institute where my dad was on the faculty. And after that, a local university, but finally my dream came true. For 12 long years I had dreamed of this moment. My bride, Jan, and I packed up the 53 Chevy. Then we got up at 3.30 in the morning, stepped into the Chevy, and left. One of my favorite mental images is of a large Midwestern city in my rearview mirror. <laughs> but we didn't aim for Oregon. We pointed the Chevy south toward Texas. I had special revelation, you see. It was the day of creation when the Lord was working on uh, mountains and waterfalls, crystal clear rivers, mountains by the sea. He spent way too much time on Oregon. And so it was late in the day when he came to Texas. <laughs> He, he said, he said, I'll just smooth it over flat <laughs> and I'll, I'll make some people who think it's the greatest place on earth. <laughs> some of those people think Texas is the kingdom. <laughs> you know, Texas, where every valley has been exalted and every... <laughs> Every mountain and hill made low. <laughs> but we know it ain't true, because if you've ever driven on our streets, you know that the rough places have not yet been made smooth. <laughs> we came to Texas for the people, specifically the people of Dallas Theological Seminary. We had decorated the bulletin board above our kitchen table with pictures of DTS from the seminary catalog. You know, I memorized the names and faces of all 15 faculty members before we ever arrived here. When it's two in the morning and you're on page two of a 10-page paper, you, you ask yourself, why did I come here? And here's your answer. It's people like this that the Lord uses to attract you to DTS, where you can learn God's Word, where you can learn to know God Himself. You know, of those 15 faculty members who were here when we got here, these four are still active on this campus 45 years later. And they weren't spring chickens then either. <laughs> Do Dr. Pentecost was our pastor. He braved ice and snow, much worse than a day like today, to come to the emergency room at Baylor Hospital when our baby choked. You never forget stuff like that. My brother followed his dream, crossed his mountains, and moved back to Oregon at the end of the rainbow in the early 70s. My folks followed him and spent the last years of their lives in Dallas, Oregon, the heavenly Dallas, of which this Dallas is but the earthly shadow. <laughs> but what about my dream? Do I still look to the West? Well, I spent most of my life pining for pine trees and fir trees. The rivers, the mountains, and the people of Oregon, you can take the boy out of Oregon, you know, but you can't take Oregon out of the boy. 
I've surrounded myself with Oregon memorabilia, and I've filled my yard with pine trees. When I take notes in a meeting, I often doodle, and my notes are usually laced with fir trees and mountains by the sea. Down through the years, I've dragged my family out to Oregon on numerous vacations. <laughs> After all, it's not a vacation unless you go to Oregon. For years, I dreamed of retirement there. I have to admit, when I heard the poet laureate's ode to Oregon, I was filled with tears. I often ask myself, why did we ever have to leave Oregon in the first place? Certainly, we could have gone back home. Because Dad lacked good academic credentials, they reduced his teaching load and stuck him in an office. He could have found another pastorate out west. People loved him. They loved his preaching and his teaching. He was a popular Bible conference speaker. Instead, he stuck to his job. But as I look in my rearview mirror and into the mirror of Scripture, I think that I now know why I had to leave Oregon. I think I can see how the Father was bringing me to maturity. God drove me from Oregon to mature my faith, to give me the kind of faith that's sure of what it hopes for, certain of what it does not see, the kind of faith that the ancients were commended for. It's part of God's discipline, Hebrews 12. His discipline doesn't seem pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And now, as a result, the seeds of faith have begun poking through the soil of my life. You see, all of my life, I looked at Oregon through the eyes of a child. Now, as a result of my Christian education, I see heaven through the eye of faith. I finally realized that I really wasn't homesick for Oregon. I was homesick for heaven. As we reach that point in our journey, when the road before us is shorter than the one in our rearview mirror, when ill health, trouble, and disappointment threaten the life of our dreams, when our dreams have, in fact, died, God is at work. He's working in our lives to bring us to maturity. These people on a far-off hill in Oregon died. They didn't receive the promise. Neither did the, hero, the Hebrews 11 heroes of faith. They were still living by faith when they died. What kind of faith? A faith that was sure of what they hoped for and certain of what they did not see. What were they hoping for? They were hoping for, for heaven, for heaven on earth. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not to be shamed. God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. A what? A city? I, I'm, I'm a country boy, for Pete's sake. <laughs> My brother pastored a old Men an old order Mennonite church in Oregon. And he was once involved in a silent retreat near the Oregon coast where the, the main facilitator was a man named John from Washington, D.C., who had never seen the Pacific Ocean. At the close of the retreat, he asked my brother, uh, Rick, uh, do you suppose 
before you take me back to the airport, that you could take me to see the Pacific. I've never seen the Pacific Ocean. He was really excited. When they got to the beach, John wandered on ahead while Rick got some things out of the car. And when Rick found him at the shore, John was sitting on a rock, weeping, overwhelmed by the beauty. When I die, he sobbed, please tell me that I'll go to Oregon. I've lived in the city all my life. I don't want any more city. Please tell me that heaven will be like this. You know, I used to have a vague idea that the new earth would be unearthly. A vague spiritual existence in a vague place way over there on the right margin of the prophecy chart. I, I thought we didn't have much information about it. Oh, I knew there would be people living on the new earth, but I thought they would be a whole new race of people, and, and I would be in heaven, wandering about on golden streets, waving palm branches, and longing for mountains by the sea. I hadn't paid much attention to what the Bible teaches about heaven, and as a result, my faith was weak, unsure, uncertain, immature. My Christian education was incomplete. Now, some of you, if you're old enough to think about heaven, and you should be, may hold a similar opinion. In heaven, if, if you can't play ball, go to concerts, learn to play the piano, go out to eat with friends, play frisbee with a golden retriever, travel to distant places, write stories, make movies. You don't want to go there. Your faith is incomplete. Your education isn't Christian yet. Heaven is a real place, spelled with a capital H. Note that Hebrews 11, by the way, talks of both a city and a country. Jesus, in his resurrect, resurrection body, went to a physical place to prepare a physical place for us. Our citizenship is there. But heaven won't stay where it is now. The new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven and reside on the new earth. The loud voice from the throne will say, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. As Glenn Crider puts it, God will move into our neighborhood. It will be heaven on earth. Yes, this earth will be destroyed, but not in the sense of being scrapped. God hasn't given up on his plan. I understand 2 Peter 3 to teach that the earth will be laid bare, purified, cleansed from sin. The new earth will still be earth. I know about no more oceans, valleys exalted, the hills made low. It will probably be the most beautiful Texas you have ever imagined. <laughs> and time shall be no more. No, that's from a song, not from Scripture. This world is not our home. That's from a song, not from Scripture. You ought to pay attention to the words that you sing. This world in its present fo fallen form is not our home. That's true. We are aliens and pilgrims here. But we will be resurrected humans living on a new resurrected earth, fulfilling the original mandate to exercise everlasting dominion over God's creation. God hasn't trashed his plan. The new earth is our home. Peter says in Acts 3 that the time will come for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Do you think that when Jesus talks about the renewal of all things in Matthew 19 that he doesn't really mean all things, that he doesn't include the earth? In his book, Heaven, Randy Alcorn writes, the predominant belief that the ultimate heaven God prepares for us will be unearthly 
could not be more unbiblical. Earth was made for people to live on, and people were made to live on earth. According to the prophets, the apostle Peter, and Christ himself, our destiny is to live forever on a restored and renewed earth. I love the biblical re-words, redeem, reclaim, restore, return, renew, regenerate, regear. <laughs> yes, my, my name is one of the biblical re-words. It's, it's in one of the translations. It's in the German translation of Romans 12. Let him who regears, let him who governs, do it with diligence. All of God's redeemed ones will regear on the new earth. We will reign with him. No, retire is not a biblical reword. We'll reign with him. We're going to work. So, I no longer insist on Oregon or bust. God's refining fire will bring us something better. These people were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect, mature. Not only better, but best. Your dearest childhood home, your most cherished dream, beckons you to another world, which we will soon see and enjoy forever and forever and forever. And we'll never have to pack up the car and point it away from the beauty. And we'll never have to look at the heavenly Oregon, the heavenly Omaha, the heavenly Texas in a rearview mirror. We'll be home to stay. God uses the losses, the disappointments, and the longings of our hearts to bring us to maturity, to develop in us the kind of faith that's sure of what it hopes for and certain of what it does not see. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Lord, please take our disappointments, our griefs and sorrows, and turn them into a faith that's sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Heaven, heaven on earth. And when we finally reach our true home, may we hear you say, well done and welcome home. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, the one who left his home to bring us home. Amen.